14 Tomcat fighter pilot in the U.S. Navy and having flown missions worldwide as a combat mission ready United States Navy pilot, Lorenz is used to working in fast moving dynamic environments where inconsistent execution can generate catastrophic results. Carrie's experience in the all-male environment of fighter aviation and her ability to pass on the lessons learned in her career allow her to deliver insight and guidance from a credible platform on leadership, high-performing teams, and peak performance. Please help me welcome the heroic Carrie Lorenz. I am so excited to be here with you today and feeling very alive, very alive. I was one of the very first women to be assigned to fly on and off of aircraft carriers. Yeah, woo! <laughs> In the time since I've left the Navy, I've worked alongside training and coaching outstanding individuals and executives and high performers just like you. So what I would like to do today is really take some of those lessons learned, uh, really from being on that journey from a small town Midwestern girl into the cockpit of a $45 million fighter jet. One of the lessons that we really learned in the military was this idea that 80% is good enough. You don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to have the perfect plan. You just need 80%, and 80% is good enough. Start taking action. Go, move, do, do something. Don't wait for the perfect environment because it's never going to be there. Now, as a busy mom of four, and I own my own business, I just finished being the president of the Women Military Aviators Association. Yeah, woo! <laughs> With about 800 members, I've got a lot going on, right? Just like you do. I am juggling so many glass balls that I am trying not to drop the most important ones on any given day. But again, as a busy mom and an entrepreneur, what I realized is I can't be perfect. I just can't. And sometimes 80% is too much. I can't even make the 80% metric. So I've adjusted 80% is good enough to 75% is good enough, <laughs> right? So now remember, I told you I have four kids. This was my Christmas card a couple of years ago. I know, I'll let that sink in for just a second. I've got three girls and a boy. I figure, hey, I'll catch him next year, right? <laughs> what I didn't anticipate was that the next year I would be even busier and I didn't even send out a Christmas card. So my 80% went to 75 to zero and then back up again. So hey, keep that in mind as we talk about the different things today, how you can balance your life. How can you get everything done? 80%, 75% is good enough. Just keep moving forward. Just keep taking action. And then at the end of the day, sometimes you just got to kind of go back to, oh, listen to you. You like my dog better than my kids. Wow, tough crowd. I did not see that coming. All right, so I'm going to move along from that one. Uh, what I would like to do is welcome you into my office, into the cockpit of a $45 million fighter jet. Now, this is an environment that is not just mentally challenging, but it's physically challenging as well. And why is that? What most people don't know is that flying airplanes on and off of the aircraft carrier is actually only 
part of our job. We actually have to have a real grown-up, full-time day job too. So we are busy, in addition to being a pilot, running squadrons that have 250 to 300 people with assets valued at right around $1 billion. So we're running the administrative offices, the training offices, the educational services offices, training all of our sailors and our Marines. And very quickly, we have to transition roles from being that administrative officer, if you will, to doing the fighter pilot thing. So what does that look like? I really just take off one hat, I go into the next room, I brief my, my flight, my mission, then I go into another room and I crawl into 35 pounds of flight gear, I go up onto the top of that aircraft carrier, crawl in my airplane, and I am launched off the front end of that aircraft carrier going from zero to almost 200 miles an hour in under two seconds flat. <gasps> I know, it's pretty sporty. <laughs> and then, within a couple of minutes, I'm going about 450 to 500 miles an hour, all the while leading two, four, six, eight, sometimes 20 wingmen safely to a target and then back to the aircraft carrier again. Why is that mentally challenging? Well, we've got a lot going on. I've got about three different radios with people talking to me on different frequencies all at the same time. So I'm trying to process a lot of information that sometimes is conflicting information. And so you're trying to filter what's the best answer. There may not always be a right answer, but what's the best answer? And I need to be able to make those decisions very, very quickly. So as I'm processing that, information, I'm flying, you know, I'm trying to really not hit the ground or anything attached to the ground or the person that I'm flying with, which you would think would not be that challenging. But when you're flying in a fighter jet, there actually are additional physical challenges. Why is it physically challenging? Well, right now we're all sitting here and we're experiencing one G or one times the force of gravity. So, for example, if you weigh what I do, which is about, it, it's a lot. <laughs> so we'll just say 200 pounds. You know, if you weigh about 200 pounds, then at one G, you should still weigh 200 pounds. But when I'm flying in my airplane and I pull back on that stick, my body instantly goes from experiencing one G to up to eight Gs, or eight times the force of gravity. That means I go from thinking my body weighs 200 pounds to weighing 1,600 pounds. <laughs> Makes 200, yeah, woohoo for the 1,600 pounders. <laughs> my people up here, we know that feeling, right? Girl Scout cookie time, oh my gosh. So, or you just go with what's on your driver's license if you want, but the challenge, I know, right? Because it's accurate at some point. Hopefully, eventually again. It's all right. It's okay. Progress, not perfection. Progress, not perfection. <laughs> So as long as I have not passed out, because all of the blood has now left my brain and it's settling in my lower body cavity and it's actually trying to escape out of my feet to the extent that there's so much pressure, it feels like my toenails are going to blow off. Which I know that's really like bad post breakfast conversation. But oftentimes people think, oh my gosh, it's so glamorous being a fighter pilot, that leather jacket, and you get to go kind of fast. And then you're like, yeah, and it feels like my toenails are gonna blow off on a daily basis too. They didn't tell me about that part. But then we get to come back and we get to land on the aircraft carrier. Landing on the aircraft carrier, ladies and gentlemen, is truly why we get paid the big bucks, as you can imagine. You're imagining that, right? <laughs> Anybody in here ever been in the military or have a family member in the military? Oh, woo! <laughs> okay, so did you make big bucks? 
No, no. So let me manage your expectations right out of the gate this morning. My humor is bad, but it's continuous. <laughs> so you're going you're to have to work to keep up with me on this one. So we come back into the air, land on the aircraft carrier, and in my airplane, when I cross the back end of the ship, I'm going about 165 miles an hour. And I slam onto the deck, and I come to a full complete stop in 1.2 seconds. Each landing is like a controlled car crash, and the force of it is so violent, it would actually make almost any other airplane explode just from the force alone. But as much as I would like to think that I have the most glamorous position on the boat being a fighter pilot, what I am keenly aware of is I cannot do this job alone. It takes an entire team to get this job done. Absolutely. What's fascinating about working in this environment is working on the top of the flight deck is actually one of the most dangerous industrial work sites in the world. And what adds to that challenge is that this is essentially a small floating city with about 5,000 people on board. Now, to add another element of, of challenge to this, every nine months, 50% of that population turns over, which means every 18 months, you have an entirely new crew trying to get this job done. And the scariest part about that with this rate of turnover, does anybody know what the average age is on an aircraft carrier? <laughs> 26, 24, it's 19 and a half years old. <gasps> I know, if that doesn't suck the air out of your lungs today, <laughs> I've got nothing. My oldest daughter is 18 and she still tries to negotiate with me. Well, everybody else is staying out late. I should be able to stay out late too. And I hear my mom coming out. I don't care what everybody else is doing. You're coming home, right? And then she's like, mom, you had 18 year olds launching you off the flight deck. And I'm like, you can have an extra 15 minutes. <laughs> Tough negotiator she is. So, but we're able to do this with this really high rate of turnover, working in a really challenging, changing, and sometimes hostile environment because we have such a clear sense of purpose and focus. Everybody on that aircraft carrier is focused on one thing and one thing alone. It's the safe launching and recovering of airplanes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Everything else is just details. So whether you work in the planning department, in intelligence, in the laundry facilities, or in food service or healthcare, everything that we do is tied to the successful launching and recovering of airplanes. And the reason that we operate that way is that we are all constantly being bombarded with a lot of different challenges, opportunities, and priorities. We don't have enough time to get everything done. So we need to understand what it is that matters the most to us. When we talk about this in a leadership perspective, whether you are, you know, the mighty power of one, you're the solopreneur, you're doing this on your own, you're trying to leverage different resources, or you're working with an entire group of people going forward. Leadership skills are for everybody. It's the reason that I was given the same exposure to the, the basic foundational skill set as all of the men and the folks who are going to be submarine drivers, doctors, lawyers. It's so we can all start from somewhere. And understanding that getting better is up to you. It's up to you to take the initiative and figure out what it is that you need to do to take your performance to the next level. It's up to you to understand what you're good at and maybe where you need some help. And the biggest thing that I can encourage you to do is don't be afraid to ask for help. Everybody needs help. Nobody gets to a top level of performance alone. We all need help and support. Absolutely. 
And the people that can figure this out quickly are the ones who can really get their ideas, their mission, their purpose, and their people aligned so that we get to where we want to go faster. In my world, speed is life. But in your world, the same thing applies. The environment is changing so quickly. You have people coming in. There are people who don't even know what it is that you do. And there's a rapid pace of change that we need to be willing and able to adapt and adjust to. And at the end of the day, we want to be able to do that with a really good attitude too. I'm talking about having standards of excellence and it's operating with the can-do spirit that we're going to get this done. We're all in, we're committed, I'm on board, right? When you think of about when I flew in that airplane, I didn't get to pick who I flew with, but when we showed up every day, we were focused on one thing. Once we launched off the, the front end of that aircraft carrier, we were focused on winning. And it's having a great attitude. When you think back to that video, did you hear what he said? Not once, but twice, he was like, oh, nice, and oh, yeah, did you hear that? So the women, in the arena will appreciate this, this one point. He was talking to himself. <laughs> yeah. He's about to pass out. All the blood has pulled from his brain and is settling in his lower body cavity. And he still has time to tell himself how awesome he is. <laughs> yeah. I love men. I've been married to one for 20 some years, so this is not man bashing, but there is something to be learned from this. When you are under stress and there's a lot of pressure, it's important to celebrate those successes. And when you look at somebody who is a breath away from passing out that can still say, look how awesome I am, if you're, <laughs> if you're not at that point yet, Look to the person next to you, give them a little high five and go, you're killing it, look at you, right? Woo, yeah, woo, we're gonna do this. We need to work hard and make those opportunities and enjoy the ride while we are here. That is what makes the hard, that is what makes the difficult worthwhile. Don't be afraid of the hard. Don't be afraid of the difficult. If you lose sight, you lose the fight. Know what's most important for you. Understand what your top priorities are as a business person and as a person. You can't have 17 top priorities. That's like a grocery store list. Those aren't priorities. You really only need like what? Bread, milk, and eggs and maybe Skittles? <laughs> NASA research says we cannot focus on more than five things. Focus on what matters. <laughs> Otherwise, what happens is you are this little teeny tiny cow in the lower right hand corner and you open up your inbox or your mailbox in the morning or your voicemail and you have a hundred new asks that are suddenly not your priorities, you're operating off of somebody else's agenda. So know what matters most to you because at the end of the day, diluted focus dilutes your power. I was always so drawn towards the Navy because of their extraordinary focus on mission before self. So I signed up for the Aviation Officer Candidate Program and it's about a 16 week program where essentially they take you as a regular college graduate and in 16 weeks, they try to teach you everything that they taught the guys and gals at the academy and it, during ROTC in four years. And they add an additional physical training element to it. So it's quite a bit of fun, as you can imagine. Uh, and I woke, up, <laughs> I woke up to about five of these lovely young gentlemen screaming in my ear the very first morning with trash can lids slinging down the hallway. My mattress is all out in the front yard and people are telling me, no, go for your dream. This is what dreams are made of. And I'm like, I didn't picture my mattress being out in the yard as part of my dream. I met my first drill instructor. And what I learned the very first week 
was that he was going to be retiring. What I also learned was in the time that he had been a drill instructor, he had never let a female who started with his class graduate with his class because, ooh, I know, because he didn't believe that women should be in the military. So he and I had what you could call a bit of a philosophical difference on that. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, it didn't matter what I thought because he was the boss of me. And what they're trying to do in this whole process with you, though, is essentially break you. They're trying to break you physically and psychologically, completely shatter you to see if, under enormous amounts of stress and duress, will you still be able to make good judgments? Will you still be a good teammate and be able to make decisions that are not necessarily in your best interest, but are in the best interest of the team? And when you were faced with these obstacles and these challenges, would you be able to be flexible and adapt and overcome whatever it was that they threw in front of you? Now, I don't want you to think that it was all terrible. We got to do some really interesting stuff, like march around with these 45-year-old rifles for hours on, on end. And we got to spend a lot of time in the pool uh, doing what they like to call advanced water survival, which should have been called, we are going to try to drown your child. Uh, but if they named it that, nobody would ever actually sign up for this program. And it was really interesting because one of the things that you learn as you go further and further down this path is that there were people who had always dreamed of being an aviator, but what they didn't put together was that flying in the Navy involves water. So one of the uh, evolutions, training evolutions that they put us through was they brought us out into Pensacola Bay and you put all of this flight gear on, and they attach, woo! All right, how about over here? <laughs> I feel like we're gonna start doing the wave pretty soon. So what they do is you have all this flight gear on, and they attach a parachute to you, and they drop you in the water, and they start dragging you through the water. Now, for those of you who have been dragged through the water with a parachute attached to you, you know that that instantly turns you into a sea anchor. So it drags you to the bottom of the water and it bounces you across the bottom, which is fairly disconcerting. So what you need to be able to do is disentangle yourself from all of this gear, go up to the surface, crawl into your, your raft, hang out very casually, then pop a flare about five minutes later, which signals that you are safe, you're sound, you're of good mind, and they can come in and get you. Well, one of my classmates was really struggling. He could not get himself uh, detached from this big sea anchor and was struggling to get up to the surface. So they get him, they pull him out of the water, and they bring him back into the helicopter. Now, for those of you who have seen Deadliest Catch before, you know that when you have a near-drowning experience, it kind of changes you at least temporarily. And my classmate is in the helicopter and he is broken. He is completely freaking out to the extent where he is desperately scratching and clawing trying to get out of the helicopter, which would mean he would be back in the water. So the rescue swimmer reaches into his bag and he grabs a marshmallow, and he shoves a marshmallow in his mouth. Now, here he is, he's in full lizard brain mode, right? He's in full survival mode, willing to be back in the water where they just saved him from. And his brain suddenly, when he has this marshmallow in his mouth, when you have salty water and it gets hot and you put a marshmallow in your mouth, you know what happens? It expands and it heats up. So your brain, from thinking it's gonna panic and hop out of the helicopter, goes, oh, there's a party in my mouth. <laughs> that when you are really, really stressed, sometimes food is actually the answer. Yes, I know, that's an unexpected takeaway for you today. 
But the reason that they put us through all of this training is really because they knew that the very small percentage of us who would go on to fly on and off of aircraft carriers would be in very, very high-risk, dangerous situations where if I'm a 1,000 miles offshore and it's nighttime and I have one engine on fire and all of my instrumentation has collapsed, which essentially means my asset is strapped into your $45 million asset, that that is not the time that all of a sudden I go, oh, I can't do this. This is too hard. Because there's no easy button in a fighter jet. So <laughs> you either go with the one that brought you or you eject. And that's not a guaranteed success. So what they want to try to allow you to figure out, and some people figure this out and other people can never figure this out, is that failure will happen. It's what you do with it that defines you, right? And the fear of failure is one of the most universally paralyzing things that every single one of us suffers from fighter pilots included. And when we are afraid to fail, what happens is that we pass up very valuable opportunities simply because we're afraid to fail. So what is that about? That's about your mindset and whether you look at failing as being part of the high-performing process or if you internalize it and go, oh, I knew this was never gonna work. I'm never gonna be any good at this. I'm not meant for this. I'm too shy, I'm too introverted, I have too many kids, I don't have any kids, I blah, blah, blah. right? I'm not enough, I'm not enough. And so then we don't go for it. We don't play big. We play small because we think it'll protect us. But it doesn't, all it does is steal our voice. So don't be afraid to fail. Banish those limiting beliefs and go for it. Just go for it. Play on those outer edges of the envelope. I always like to tell people, if you're not doing one thing every day that puts a lump in your throat or a pit in your stomach, then you are becoming complacent. And for me, Operating on the aircraft carrier, that's a very, very dangerous place to be. That's where people get hurt. But for the rest of us in Normalville, that's also a very dangerous place because it means we're never going to be the person that we were meant to be or that we could be, simply because we think that we can protect ourselves. You're going to make mistakes. Learn from it, grow from it, incorporate those lessons learned, and move on. Feel that fear anyway. Every day, get comfortable being uncomfortable. It's the key to success. Anybody in here ever see the Navy Blue Angels? Oh, they're awesome, right? They're amazing. I've got friends who are Blue Angels. I probably have to polish their boots. The reason I show the Blue Angels is because there are points of times during their air show where they fly between 24 and 36 inches apart from each other, going 360 miles an hour. Now that's about as close as the person sitting next to you. That requires a very, very high level of trust. I flew the F-14 and we did not fly 24 inches apart from each other because our wings move. And you don't wanna be two feet away from somebody else and have your wings start to arbitrarily move. So we were more the 36 inch to 48 inches apart from each other. I know, no sprinkles for second place, right? Oh well. But, but people will say, I could never do that. I would never be able to do what you did. But that's not where we start. We all start from somewhere. And for us, when we are learning how to do this, we're starting a quarter mile away from somebody. And somebody else who's flopping around in the air and you're looking at them going, what are they doing? How come they're all over the place? Because surely it's not me. It's got to be them over time because we trust each other and we both know what it is we're trying to achieve we're able to get closer and closer and closer because we know what the other person is going to do and we know that they are going to follow up 
and follow through on what it is they said they were going to do. And that's a very, very big thing. It feels like that should be common sense, but it's one of the top things that we forget to do when we get so busy and we get overwhelmed with whatever our task is at hand. And we think, oh, I'll, I'll answer them tomorrow or I'll get back to it. And we don't follow up on those promises that we've made, not only to other people, but to ourselves. Trust and belief. It's trust and belief in each other and knowing that we have each other's best interest at heart and believing that the other person will be there no matter what happens. We are committed to this, we're committed to each other, and we are committed to success. This is me on graduation day. Yeah, woohoo! With my original drill instructor. Yeah. But it was a really interesting time. There was a lot of conversation about women in combat and whether or not the country was ready to have women in combat aircraft. In the timing of this, I had the potential to, if everything worked out, to be one of the first people to fly in combat. So they sent somebody down on my graduation day to interview me. Now, you would think that from a communications perspective, I would be given all the tools for success. Talking points, things to stay away from, good things to say, little bullet points, all that stuff. I was given nothing. And to the extent that my drill instructor stood right next to me with his feet together, toes at a 45 degree angle, and with a thousand yard stare and a face calmer than you could etch in granite, and the only thing he said to me was, do not F this up. <laughs> so there's your communications training today as well. <laughs> Just don't screw it up. <laughs> and you can tell this was a really important interview, clearly by the size of the microphone, right? <laughs> There was not a word that was going to be missed in this interview. So, and it was fascinating. I'm very tall, I'm six feet tall, and similar to today, yeah, yay for the six footers. Uh, you know, I had these <laughs> three and a half inch beautiful white pumps on, and uh, the person that was interviewing me was Wolf Blitzer. <laughs> yeah, and it turned out, it, it must have been a good interview, because right after this, Wolf got his own TV show. So I guess things worked out really well for him. Uh, but it was very awkward because the whole time I'm trying to figure out what do I say? Well, how am I going to sound articulate? What am I, you know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes or say the wrong thing. He's standing on a milk crate. <laughs> so I'm standing like this, kind of going, are you, does somebody need to hold him? Is this... It was really, really awkward. So if you're ever given the opportunity to do an interview live on television, uh, it usually goes a little easier if the person standing next to you is not wobbling on a milk crate. So some more food for thought for you on that one. All of these ideas about teamwork, trust, mutual support, they're not just catchphrases for us. They're not just nice little taglines or something that should be on a motivational poster, but it's a way of life. It's the way we act and behave and take action and believe in the people that we are working with. So I take all of this with me and I start my journey through flight school. And all of this discussion is still happening about women in combat and whether we're ready for it. And I just figure, you know what, I'm going to do the best job that I can and hopefully I finish at the top so that if they open up the slots to women in combat, that then if I get it, nobody can say I was assigned that airplane simply because I was female but because I was qualified. So I worked my tail off. And I was almost two years into this program when I really ran into the biggest barrier. I got called into the commanding officer's office. And I show up and he has all of these people on speakerphone. And I'm like, oh, this thing just went downhill fast. And they proceed to tell me that since they haven't lifted the law that bars women from flying, there's no place for me anymore in the Navy. And I can either get out of the Navy or I can go to a non-flying job. Which do I want? Come on, we need to know now, which do you want? I was 
gutted, gutted. That was not the conversation I thought I was about to have. So I thought for a second and just said, you know what? Um, these are two really interesting options. Can I get back to you? And they said, okay, but it can't take a lot of time. So I went back into this briefing room where I was sitting there, I'd been pulled out of a brief with 50 other student naval aviators. This is where coming from Wisconsin comes into play. Because we're pretty stoic folks, right? We're, we're not super demonstrative. And I'm sitting here like this. And I have my arms crossed so tightly and I'm holding onto my body because I know I am about to cry. And it's not going to be a pretty cry. It's not going to be one of those graceful 3D IMAX cries where you're like, oh, bless her heart. Look, oh, she looks so sad. No, it's not going to be that. It's going to be one of those ugly snorful cries where you're making animal sounds and you're heaving and hiccuping and you've got snot rolling out of your nose into your mouth and you're like, oh, it's salty. <laughs> So I have to sit there until I'm convinced I'm not going to cry. And then the big test comes and I have to look up because that's always the big test. And I look up and oh, one little tear sneaks out. And I kind of go like this and I flick it. And the guy next to me looks at me and I'm like, oh, allergies. <laughs> you know, sorry. Uh, because what I realized sitting there was that the only reason I just had that conversation was that I dared to show up different. So I went back into the commanding officer's room, our office, knocked on his door, walked into the office and said, sir, with all due respect, because that's what you say, uh, I don't want to get out of the Navy. I don't want to go to a non-flying job. We need to find a third way. <laughs> That is not how those conversations usually go. And he sat there with a look of shock and horror on his face, so I just left. And they called me back in about a week and a half later and said, you know what, we looked at everybody's records, and sure enough, you are at the top of everybody who's gone through flight school in the last five years. So we... Y'all, that's not my lesson learned. <laughs> he said, we're going to carve a new path for you. We're going to keep you on as a flight instructor because we're pretty convinced that Congress will pass the law quickly because that's what Congress does. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I'm still in the game. So I said, thank you very much. And every day I showed up as if I was going to the fleet with the rest of my classmates. And it's not easy. It's not easy when you have these barriers put in front of you. It's not easy when people are telling you, we're not ready for you yet. We're not ready for the way you're doing business. We're not so sure about that. But you stay focused on what matters. You do what you know is right. You operate with integrity and you go forward anyway. And I stayed focused on what mattered and that was earning those wings of gold. And it's a good thing that I did because the day, the day my class was filling out their dream sheet, which is where you fill out what you want to fly and where you want to go fly, was actually the day that Congress lifted the law that banned women from flying. And this is not about being stubborn. This is about being persistent, staying tenacious, staying committed when it's not fun right now. It's knowing where you want to go in the future and staying gritty and going for it anyway. And I focused on what mattered to me. And the day that they assigned those jets was the day that I found out I was headed to fly the F-14. And this was really exciting for me because not only that, am I going to fly the Navy's best fighter in the world, I was heading to Southern California. And we know what that means. <laughs> but I show up and I'm like a new bear in the zoo. They're like, ooh, female fighter pilot thing. What is that? And I'm just like, do y'all not have wives and girlfriends? Because it's pretty much the same gear, only I fly. <laughs> 
So it was a very interesting time. And what I learned, though, was how important perceptions are and how much perceptions matter. I was under this huge microscope, and I believe that everybody else saw me just as a regular fighter pilot. And what I didn't realize was there was a bit of a disconnect there. And I had one of my instructors, and I share this story in my book, who after a very, very uh, engaging, challenging flight, his first debrief comment to me was, you're really gonna make awesome wife material. I know, yeah, which could be a good thing, but I'm like, unless you're sliding a ring up the rails, buddy. <laughs> I don't know, we don't have a lot to talk about. So it was interesting though, because what I learned from that though, and, and when I crawled out of my jet that day, was that I promised to myself I would never give anybody feedback that wasn't actionable. We had great processes that allowed for a lot of flexibility in a very changing environment, for every one hour of effective planning you can do, you can save 200 execution errors. So if you're trying to figure out a way to balance your life and get everything done that you want to get done, it takes planning and foresight on the front end, which is where your priorities come into play. Know what is the most important thing for you to achieve. In my airplane, I only had six feet of clearance when I crossed the back end of the ship, from where my tail hook hung down to the edge of the ramp, coming aboard at 165 miles an hour. You can imagine at night why that becomes terrifying. Because when you're a thousand miles away from land and there are no lights, it is so pitch dark, you can't even see your hand. You're pretty sure it's still attached to you, but you're not 100% sure because you can't see it at all. And it's very, very challenging to operate in that environment. So part of being able to do this is being able to face your fears in spite of that. When we were working off the West Coast, we would go around the world in a westerly direction, which meant that we went through some of the world's most dangerous sea states. And the back end of the aircraft carrier oftentimes would be up out of the water 30 to 40 feet in the air. That's hard and that's challenging. Now remember I said we have to have a good attitude, right? And we have a great attitude even when we're stressed. We do part of this even with the terminology that we use. For example, when we're deployed and where there's no other place for us to land, being out of gas is a very suboptimal situation, right? It's very bad. So we call it something fun. We call it bingo. Because when you're out of gas, bingo, baby. Everybody likes bingo, woo, bingo. Because I can't key the microphone when I'm coming aboard the ship and say, 107, Tomcat Ball, I'm out of gas, and if you don't launch a tanker right now, oh my gosh, I'm gonna crash, and what if I take everybody out with me, and this is gonna happen, and <gasps> call my mom. No, that doesn't invoke confidence in the people that I'm working with whose toes are lined up 18 inches from where my wingtip is gonna go by their face at 165 miles an hour. So instead, I simply key the microphone, and I say, 107, Tomcat ball, bingo on the ball. And the guys answer, Roger, 107, keep it coming. And everyone's like, all right, she's got this under control. Except for the guy who's about 10 levels below sweeping the floor, and he's like, is she? She's out of gas. So then he stops and watches. Because there's a TV in every room, so everybody can watch you come aboard live. This is like pre-Kardashian era. And I know we love the Kardashians. Sometimes they take the heat off of us. I share that with you to give you some insight into our world and even how our minds work, because I think it's clear that in order to survive and thrive in a really stressful situation, we need to surround ourselves with the people that support us, the people that bring us humor, that bring us joy. It's not that we're not afraid, it's that we feel that fear and we do it anyway. So think about that. Think about as you move on to that next step. My charge to you 
is define the courage to summon up what it takes and go for it anyway. In the next 30 days, do one thing, one thing every day that makes you a little bit scared. Thank you very much. You guys have been amazing today. Thank you.